Medications for Opioid Use Disorders in Correctional Settings, Shifting the Paradigm, Creating a Balanced Correctional and Rehabilitative Approach. The Opioid Response Network is funded by SAMHSA to provide resources and technical assistance needed locally to address the opioid crisis. This video is part of a series to provide guidance on the implementation of medications for opioid use disorder in correctional facilities. Leading corrections and behavioral health experts present information on topics such as the use of medication, models of delivery, diversion, and linkages to care and community support. An interview with Michael White, Community Medical Services. What is your job title and what are the responsibilities of your role? My job for Community Medical Services is basically an advocacy uh, a position. However, in that advocacy comes uh, projects with hospitals, jails, uh, fire departments, uh, those types of external supports for the community members that are struggling with the opioid crisis just like us. Uh, we want our individuals or our patients to be able to connect with those uh, community providers, community connections, and not be stigmatized or discriminated against. So developing those relationships helps our clients have a better experience through their recovery. How do you find clients, organizations, and systems that are looking for you to act as its advocate? It can change and it's kind of evolving. So I would say now people reach out and uh, they're trying to get ahead of the curve or an incident happened, but very much back in the day, it was because of tragedy. And so we would hear a story about a mother getting her child taken away just because she was on medication assisted treatment. And the judge was basically ordering for severance, meaning the child being taken away from mom just because she was on MAT and she could have been sober for two years, but she's usual, utilizing this medication. Um, so the stories like that are there could have been a death in the jail. And so uh, kind of um, prompting that jail staff that these things are needless and they don't need to happen. Uh, there is a... Um, solution to what they're kind of going through and struggling with. And so it's a lot of my projects, unfortunately, are developed on tragedy. What is a positive outcome you helped create? So I've seen a lot of uh, children returned home uh, due to uh, a lot of work that our peer supports do and a lot of work that our case managers do by going to um, child family team practices and those types of things. I've seen jails uh, like Maricopa County uh, Jail, for instance, start handing out naloxone to people being um, released along with harm reduction cards on how to keep safe and alive and not get hep C and uh, other medical issues that might come with opiate use disorder. Um, but just a sis system change from corrections all around has been something I got. I've been fortunate enough to see in the last five years. Um, where they are truly saving lives. Uh, they are having people come in on their worst day of life. They get them on a medication and, you know, uh, we have some data through the Matt Padoa grant that demonstrates that people get on MAT, they get released from incarceration, they do really well. Uh, they get jobs, they get permanent housing, they do all those social determinants of health. And um, so overall, it's just been um, great to see the change. Are there any specific challenges you face when working with a correctional institute? There's always challenges. Uh, in my world, it's kind of separated in three uh, groups. So you have kind of the third party health care provider, usually if it's a bigger type of jail or system. Uh, you have the sheriff sometimes elected or you have the governor appointed director of the DOC facility. But then you have line staff. And so to get those uh, folks all aligned on the same um, issue sometimes is uh, problematic or hard. Um, but I think after you get a program set up and moving, uh, the benefits that they see, uh, they, they align very quickly. So, you know, the suicide observation rates of 15 minute intervals go down because not as many people, uh, especially when they're opiate use uh, disorder, they're not on suicide watch. They've started this medication. Uh, they're not having bodily functions from withdrawal take place in the cell. They're going home safe to their families. Um, I have a cousin that worked in corrections and got accidentally uh, pricked by a needle. Um, so he couldn't be intimate with his wife for six months because they didn't know if he had something or not. And so uh, those, those stories hold true for me and my family. Um, 
just uh, going home safe. You know, corrections officers deserve to go home safe too um, and all this. And I think it cuts down on a lot of uh, resources that jails spend on the opiate use disorder uh, population. From your perspective, how have things changed since you started working in the field? Everything. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely everything. Uh, it, it was like, it was a fight back in 2015. Babies were being taken away from home, from moms. Uh, Health care providers within the system are judging patients based on, you know, a, a disease that they have. And... Um, holding this carrot of medication, whether they were, um, if they deserved it or not, uh, everything. I mean, it's just day and night. What positives do you see in such grim situations? Maricopa County Jail, they knew the numbers. So they were having 900 people every month come in with opiate use disorder. 450 of those could be diagnosed with opiate use disorder. So they knew they had this revolving door and they knew they had this issue. So uh, with those numbers, they decided to make a change and they got an independently licensed OTP in their system, all five jails. Um, and it, to say that they've saved lives would be an understatement. I mean, they've made an impact on Arizona and all. Um, and then with the ability of that, you know, you start leveraging that story and Dr. Clark's story and Rikers Island, who's, you know, one of the originals and those types of things. And it's just appropriate health care. Somebody doesn't have to die for getting a traffic ticket because they're on heroin or alcohol or you name it. Right. So withdrawal doesn't work. Uh, you know, uh, detox doesn't work for this population. It's 10 to 12% outcomes. We have something that works 40 to 75% of the time, whatever data you want to look at. Um, and it's just appropriate healthcare. Uh, so I don't understand, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still on this grim mark, I guess. Um, but the the change we're seeing places in Montana, you know, small, my not North Dakota, they're doing MAT. Uh, North Dakota DOCR is phenomenal. They're doing it up for 36 months, getting 90% of their opiate use disorder population because they're out within 32 months and they're doing all three medications. Uh, so I've, I've been able to see a lot change. Uh, there's still a lot, of, a lot to go. But then you've seen um, state and federal organizations like yourselves jump on and be able to help people uh, you see a lot more um, information and education taking place at, you know, NatCon and uh, RX Summit and all these other places that uh, used to be like the OTPs used to be the black sheet of black sheep of the behavioral health uh, industry. And so it's it's been different to see agencies just return our phone calls because that wasn't something that happened back in, you know, I've worked in OTPs during college from 2010 to 2014. I wouldn't get a call back from a residential. I'd be like, we don't want your people here. So I've seen that change too. What was the topic of your presentation? Linkages to care. So basically setting people up for success uh, after they've been incarcerated, but developing some kind of uh, warm handoff upon release. So some of the things that we've implemented is peer supports, picking that individual up from the facility, uh, taking them into the clinic, because that can be an anxiety driven uh, task. You know, you get out of jail and then you're supposed to go to a clinic and even walking into a clinic can be a lot, you know. So um, those types of things, we have peer supports go in, uh, special focus on pregnancy populations where uh, do they need residential, do they need to escape a troubled relationship, uh, do they need an OBGYN, do they got that, prenatal care, uh, family classes, because uh, one of the things I always uh, find funny is that we put parents in parenting classes after the babies arrived, but what if we did it before? I think uh, we don't have to have the fire start. So um, those types of things and just uh, do they need residential? Do they need IOP? Do they need a higher level of care than what we can't offer? Uh, so we have a lot of system partners in any kind of uh, community that we work in. Who funds these programs? Are they from the federal, state, or local level? Combination. So uh, we were lucky enough to get the Matt Padoa grant. So we kind of had three years to figure out uh, if it made sense to do this strategy and those types of things. I've heard different uh, ideas. It's definitely a combination for uh, our staff and our company. So a lot of companies may put uh, money into advertising or marketing. We can take a chunk out of that and uh, hire actual people to do pro bono work inside jails. 
Um, grants definitely help uh, because you cannot reimburse for services behind the walls. But there are little tricks of the trade or, um, you know, to support your community is advertising in itself and marketing in itself because those agencies will then um, sing to the heavens for you and they'll say, what a great system partner and those types of things. Um, and so some of the some of those tricks can be brought on uh, sustainable wise. You know, I think as behavioral agency, especially residentials right now, they're struggling to keep their beds full and those types of things. But if you're working closely with a jail or closely with other system partners, a community in general, the referrals kind of come out of those relationships. So really being involved in the community provides your business to flourish. Do you have anything you would like to add? I don't have much except for uh, one thing I, I think uh, we as uh, people who have already gone down this road and implemented MAT into corrections and those types of things uh, we take for granted is uh, how close knit and understanding the community is and how difficult it can be to implement services, especially if you're trying to become an individually licensed OTP or to co-locate like Rhode Island's model. Um, and those types of things are even being the option three, which is delivering uh, community based services from the community into the facility and those types of things is that um, it really is a community that's willing to support you. So uh, policies and procedures, workflows, all these other things. Uh, I remember back in the day I did not have a buprenorphine um, policy and procedure and it was going to take three months out of this project to probably see the legal department go down this road and these things. Uh, so I reached out to Dr. Clark of Rhode Island. She's like, here's my policy and procedure. And I was like, all right, thanks. You just saved us three months. And so I've been uh, fortunate enough to be able to do that for other folks trying to become their own OTP and kind of share Maricopa County stuff or uh, share Montana stuff or Alaska's, uh, you know, samples of MOUs or whatever, but there really is a community out there to save you a bunch of time. So it's not like death by delay or you lose that momentum. And so I think that's important to note uh, for anybody that needs support because there is a community out there to support you. Technical assistance is available to support the evidence-based prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorder. To request technical assistance, visit opioidresponsenetwork.org. Network.org.